now, a few weeks now, um, is um, dealing with sin in the church mm. or oh. dealing with hurt and discerning between the two. Right? So, so that is what it's about. But I think so. So many of you guys know, some of you guys don't know, but um, so Eric and I, for a few years, um, taught in the church what's called emotional recovery. ER. Right? ER, right? Mm -hmm. Some of us needed to go to ER. Um, sometimes I feel like I need to go to ER like weekly, like a couple times a week, you know, just emotional recovery, right? Like Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was like feeling some stuff. And he had to go, okay, wait. Like, I gotta go to God and put this all under God's will, right? Um, but um, one of the things that, that we taught in emotional recovery that I think is so so incredibly important is, um, is how to look at being hurt, mm. right? Um, because you know we come into um, we come into contact with the blood of Christ. We come into the family. We're deeply encouraged. We're like this is awesome. Yay, yay, yay! Right. And then you're and then somebody hurts you. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, wait! I thought this was the kingdom of God. Okay. <laughs> Anybody ever feel like that? <laughs> Shai's like, I got two hands and two feet up, right? Yeah. Yeah. She says, You're like, against us. <laughs> wait a minute, I'm right? All the limbs louder. And, 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 and then we say this, then we say this, but I thought they were a disciple of Jesus. No. no. Surely we've never said that, right? And it's like all of a sudden we think because somebody is a disciple of Jesus that, that they will perfectly never sin against us. Like, we have this weird notion yep. that this is just not going to happen. And then yeah. when it does, you're like, <gasps> yep. I'm, this is not This is not the church. This, <gasps> this is not from God. Uh -oh. The Holy Spirit is not here. Oh. Where is the exit door? You know oh, what I mean? No. <laughs> um, and you go there. No, 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 we get to no. only go there. God yeah. doesn't love me. Oh. Or we go, God loves me, but... Not these people, and we're like, I'm gonna oh. do God. I'm gonna do Jesus. Just me and Jesus, right? Even though everything yeah. we've learned from the scriptures is like, you actually need to be attached to the light of your cross. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, so all of our convictions go out the window, and uh, and and like we're just like, I can't do this, right? Um, and so some of you guys have, you know, you felt that, like, probably the, the day you got baptized, the week you got baptized, <laughs> uh, maybe yesterday, but, you're like. This may not be the church for me. You know what I mean? Oh. Um, <laughs> um, do you just see the sit over there? No, you just stand. You're going to stand? Okay. Yeah. Um, and so so sometimes we just need to, like, just clear our minds and go, okay, wait, right? And so, guys, like, I can, I can preach this lesson because I've lived everything in this lesson mm -hmm. for better or for worse, okay? Mm -hmm. Um but inside of ER, right, there's something that we taught that was really, really awesome. And it's actually something that the world teaches too. Now, anything we know that, the, that works in the world that, pr that, is, that produces godliness, right, whether they attribute it to that or not, um, it only works because, like, you can actually find it in the Bible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Like if we look at like I used to teach psychology principles and business principles um, at UC Berkeley and many other institutions and um, and I could find all of it in the Bible. <laughs> right. Um, cool. And so it's really cool. And so I would get these different studies and I'm like, well, that's a Matthew. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> that's, that's the Jethro principle. That's all up in the Bible. Right. <laughs> like. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you know, <laughs> teach somebody to teach somebody to teach somebody. Like, that's Jesus' ministry. Like, that's not rocket science. It's like mm -hmm. science, right? Um, this whole concept of mentoring in the business world. I'm like, dude, that's been there for ages. Like, yeah. that, ew. <laughs> like, it's nothing, right? Like, Ecclesiastes tells us there's nothing new under the sun that's been, that hasn't been, um, uh, that hasn't already been. And so, anyways, so... Um, so I share all that to say that there's this one principle that the world teaches, but we can find it in the scripture. Um, and um, it's called Rebt, R-E-B-T. 
exercise going through her her memory banks going to learn this. R E B R E B is a boy. And it stands for rational, emotive, behavior, therapy. Rational, emotive, behavior, therapy. Now, it's fun because when I started to put this inside of our ER classes um, up in San Francisco, I don't think LA did this, but I did start doing it in San Francisco, and um, the Blascos that are running it worldwide, they were like, this is incredible. Um, I was like, yeah, this is part of just, it just is right, but but what when I started doing it, we saw a lot of uh, a lot of growth in people. But um, basically, but one of the things that was said to me is Cindy Oaks, our shepherd shepherdess down uh, in San Francisco. She goes, "Only you, Ariel. Only you, being a total rational person, would rationalize emotions." Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, it's true. Um, and so, so, um, so just know that's a process, rational emotive behavior therapy. But I'm gonna teach you from the scriptures, okay, amen? And then I'm gonna come back and slap some, slap some psychology so you can see how it marries together. Sounds good? Okay. Yeah. Uh, but, it's, but it's really, really cool. So, so when you get, when, so invariably you're gonna get hurt by a disciple. You're gonna, even though you're in the, in the kingdom of God, you're still gonna get hurt by people outside the world just because we became disciple doesn't mean that our life is perfect. It doesn't mean that we're not gonna still have relational challenges and all these kinds of things. Right. But what it does mean is that we learn to handle them differently, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So this is like a basic introductory, sort of kind of with a little bit of meat, sort of kind of, okay? Mm. Um, but let's start by going to um, one of the key scriptures on how to deal with sin in the church. Amen? Yeah. Anyone know where that is? Matthew, Matthew 18. 18, okay. All right. So, and I did make a distinction between dealing with sin versus dealing with hurt. Mm. Mm. Because sometimes, uh, you know, we go straight to the scripture without really thinking it through. Okay, so Matthew 18, um, verse 15. Matthew 18, verse 15. Um, and it says, if your brother or sister sins, and some manuscripts say sins against you, okay, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, Tell it to the church, and if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. All right. So there's a lot here, um, but what I first want to what I first want to focus on is um, if your brother or sister sins or sins against you, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. Right. So we all know that we've all been hurt. Right. Um, by, by somebody in the church or, you know, over the years, whatever, you know, church you've been to. Um, and so I want you to think, what is your knee-jerk reaction when you get hurt? Right? Um, because we all can react a certain way depending on how we get hurt, right? And we all have what's called, what I call at least, a sin cycle, right? Um, and so I know for me, right, so we have five core emotions. Mad, sad, glad, afraid, embarrassed. If you don't know them, write them down. Um, my kids took my college classes. They know these. They they, they literally took my college classes at like nine and ten, um, and uh, they took it like three times, so they know this. Um, but um, but anyway, so so those are the five core emotions, right? And so one of the things that we can do is, can you repeat that, please? Sure. I love it because the first few rhyme. Mad. Sad, glad, afraid and embarrassed. Afraid and embarrassed. Yeah, afraid and embarrassed. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I know that my sin cycle is um, when I get hurt by somebody. If it's if if somebody is discipling me on something, correcting me on something, sometimes I can feel hurt. You may relate to that. Uh, okay, you yeah. get corrected, you can feel hurt. <laughs> Says the woman I disciple. Yeah, yes. actually, yes, I can feel that way. With conviction. <laughs> With conviction. <laughs> so you get, 
scratch on something and you can feel and you can you immediately have this feeling, right? Right. And um, and depending on the situation, um, you can feel hurt because you feel I know for me, I can feel embarrassed. Mm. Right? Mm. And and this happens like in a matter of seconds, guys. And I can go from embarrassed to mad to sad, right? Mm. And, um, and then I can go to glad, mm. right? So first I'll get embarrassed, which is worldly sorrow. Mm. <laughs> then I get mad, which is pride. And then I get sad and oftentimes that sadness is me driving my heart and my emotions to God to go, okay, wait. If this is, if this is true, I don't want to dishonor God. I just need to change. And then I go to glad. Because I'm like, right? I'm like, okay. Make sense? Mm-hmm. You guys are like, oh, man, okay, any, any more? Because that's about it. That's all the lesson mm-hmm. I got today. No, mm-hmm. but some of us, we, we can immediately go to sad. Mm-hmm. And we get down on ourselves. <clears throat> Again, worldly sorrow, right? Mm-hmm. Some of us immediately go to anger, right? So be thinking, like, when I get corrected on something <clears throat> or something, right? Like, because what we can do is we can feel hurt. And if we don't take that hurt to God then somebody's just trying to help us see what's keeping us from honoring God more, but yet we think that they're in sin. Does that make sense? Well, she didn't say it the right way. I will tell you something. Like, I have never been corrected the right way. Okay, preach. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I have never been corrected. You know why? Because I don't like being corrected, so it's never going to be the right way. Right? <laughs> Like it's gonna come at the wrong time. They're gonna say something after it, and then I'm already feeling something about something else. And so they corrected the correction was fine, but what they said after it was not fine. So now the correction's invalid. Yes, right. Oh, so, not invalid. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, right. So I I have never been corrected in a godly way because my posture has always been like ah, really. Right? Um, and so, you know, and not to say that the person that was correcting me didn't do it in a godly way. I'm sure they did. Um, sure. I'm sure. I'm sure it was godly. Um, I just, you know, I just went into that moment thinking, like, this was just going to be a chat. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, anybody ever calls you to have a chat, you just better buckle up yeah. and get humble real quick. Yeah. <laughs> right? And then just go, just go, God, please just show me my sin and give me courage to be humble. That's it. Yeah. Just, 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 just give me courage. Just let me give me give me the humility to choose humility. So, but if we look at this passage, right, it says, if your brother or sister sins against you, go and show them their fault, right? So, so what we do is we go, I feel hurt. That means they sinned against me because I feel hurt. So now I'm going to show them what they did wrong. Have you ever been there? Yeah. Right? Or you might wait a couple days, um, and instead of, like, really going and reconciling your heart with God, you're reconciling and confirming with God, like, no, they sinned against me. And let me, okay, you know what I need? I need to find the sin that they were in. Oh. Right? Anybody ever do that? Oh. Yeah. Just me? Yeah. And, like, yeah. you're putting together a whole, like, yeah. you're like, this is how they sinned against me in this work. Right? A whole list. A whole list. Yeah. Right? <laughs> kind of, uh, uh. Um, but, but, right, um, it's interesting because um, it says that if we, if we go past that, it says, if they listen to you, you have won them over. So it says, if your brother or sister says, and point out their fault just between the two of you, if they listen to you, you have won them over. Okay? So I did a little, I did a little research. And um, that word, listen, if they listen to you, okay? We hear that word and we go, 
if they agree with you oh. and repent and say sorry, you won them over. Yeah. Well, well, you well. know we do that. Yeah. That's what right? I'm but did Jesus ever apologize? <laughs> did you ever part. see an apology happen in the Bible? No. No. Never. Well, like, just Paul. But And he was like, sorry, not sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <She's> <laughs> like, you know, in, in his letter to the church in Corinth, he's like, if my letter hurt you, I'm sorry, but. but yeah. That's <laughs> <what I'm doing. laughs> Like, like, I'm sorry all. you feel hurt, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> and we can learn from Paul, but you were in sin, ah, right? Uh, we like to use that scripture, we don't like that scripture used on us, yeah. right? Um, I'm sorry you feel hurt, but you were in sin, um, and, uh, but anyways, so outside of that, we really don't see... We don't see disciples or Jesus or God, like, apologies are not happening. Make sense? Right. And we read this passage, okay, well, if they agree with me that they were in sin and that what they did was wrong and that they hurt me, then, um, yeah, then I won them over. Yikes. Is, but that's how we think. Yeah, right? that is mm-hmm. exactly. That's exactly how we think. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, conscious or unconsciously, um, that's how we think. But this is not what it says. Okay? That word, um, to listen, it actually is the Greek word akuo. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A-K-O-O. O. <laughs> Three O's? Yeah, A-K-O-O-O. Okay. Oh, okay. And it actually mm-hmm. means Uh-oh. to consider... <laughs> It means to consider, to understand, to hear as to learn, to give an audience to. At no point does it mean that they actually agree with you. Wow. Wow. (laughs) And here's why. Because as we go down in this passage, and it says, if they listen to you, you have won them over. Won them over actually is the word kerdaino mm-hmm, mm-hmm. k-e-r dash d-a-h dash e-e dash n-o and this actually means to gain to acquire away from evil to gain or shun from evil, to gain Christ's favor or fellowship away from evil. Whole new meaning. So if somebody sins against you, right, the proof is not that they, the proof of winning them over is not their agreement First of all, it's that they've considered it. Mm -hmm. That they are trying to understand and to learn and to hear genuinely your perspective. Whether they agree or not is not necessarily the goal. (coughs) The goal is not for them to agree with you, but for them to agree with who? (coughs) God. It's for you, for them to agree with the scripture. For them to be won over from evil. Because the reality is, guys, and you know this, sometimes we get hurt based on perspective, mm-hmm. not based on anything biblical. Yeah. We get hurt based on opinion and experience, not necessarily something biblical. Yeah. Right? That's most of our hurt. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Now, there, there are times where it's just, you know, you can show them scripture and just go, hey, right, like your, your actions were really unloving. Right? And, and you know, I had that conversation recently somebody brought something to my attention and said that you know Ariel your actions were unloving and I was like okay let me consider that and I'm like you know what you're right I was a coward I didn't uphold the scriptures in this way and I should have right at that point did that person win me over absolutely they won me over to the scriptures to walk in the light to be honest and go you know what I can't be like this I'm not gonna be like this does that make sense yeah okay um and so um, it's to convince them of godliness. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. All right? But it's not just to convince them of one opinion over another. Mm-hmm. Right? 
So that's why I say like it's really important that we can we can really discern like okay, is this person in sin or is this or am I just hurt for some reason, right? Um, and so some of the things. So how do you discern that? How do you discern whether or not somebody's in sin or whether or not you're just hurt? Okay, um, or both. Okay. Um, well, let's go to Second Corinthians chapter five. 2 Corinthians is a great book to learn about sin and what not to do. Um, so 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now we know that this book is being written to a church full of disciples. Okay? And it was a church full of disciples who kind of gone off their rocker. Not kind of. They, they hugely gone off of their rocker. Right? So many false teachings that started to creep into the church. Right? There was sexual immorality. People were bragging about immoral. I mean, they were a disaster, right? They had to get, like, completely, like, um, retaught, if you will. Um, so, if we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and, um, let's see. I may have written that down wrong. Oh, I'm in 1 Corinthians. I'm like, that is not what that's supposed to say. Okay, 2 mm -hmm. Corinthians. Okay, here we go. Chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse 10. Now, you see the title, right? We know these titles are written by man. It's Reconciliation, uh, the Ministry of Reconciliation, right? Um, in the one just before it. Um, but, let me see. Oh, wait. Not 2 Corinthians. Yeah, 20. Sorry, not 10. 20. Um, so 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. But we see that um, what Paul's trying to get them to do is he's he's like, guys, come on. Like, we've been through this. Like, we're ambassadors of Christ, right? So let's let's pick it up in verse 11. I'll read through verse 20. It says, since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. So he's speaking of, of himself and the brothers who came to help them, set them straight. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in their heart. For if we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God, we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So, from now on, we regard everybody the way that we did before we were a disciple of Jesus. Yeah. Okay, I get it. I, get, I hear that. <laughs> that's not what the Bible says, is it? Okay. No. No. It says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, and is anybody in Christ here in this room today? Yes. yes. Okay. So if we are in Christ, the new creation has come, right? The new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling to the world, where reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. There's so much we could unpack from this, but so much. so much. I mean, just read this passage and meditate on it, and you'll never have a problem again in like how to. Um, and He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God were making His appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Okay? God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. All right. Then we just go on and on and on. So, he's not calling them to get baptized, right? These are disciples who had gotten baptized. What, are they, what is he calling them to do? To be reconciled to God. This church had been in a bunch of sin. They were hurting each other, right? And so what God is trying to help us see here through the scriptures is that, look, 
if you have, to, like, if you, if you're seeing sin, if you're hurt, whatever, he's like, first you got to go get reconciled with God. And I think that's a piece that we don't always do, mm-hmm. right? Myself included. I've got to make sure that I do this, okay? I've got to get a lot better at this, right? Um, the Bible tells us, in your anger, do not sin, right? It says also, um, do not let the sun go down in your anger, right? Or in any intense emotion. And, and so we can take those passages and go, I need to get right with my brother or sister right now before the sun goes down. No. You need to get right with God before the sun goes down. Yeah. Right? Okay? Like, you need to get your heart right and resolved before God before you go help that person in their sin so that you can first determine whether or not that person is in sin or perhaps... They weren't in sin, it just exposed sin in you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, I can't tell you how many times somebody has, has hurt me or said something, and, and I have, like, I have felt like they were inconsiderate or unloving, and, like, how could, you know, all the things that we talked about earlier. Um, and that was my defense mechanism to not have to look at what they exposed in my heart. Right, um, and so I ha- I've had to learn how to go. Okay, wait. This pricked my soul for a reason, right? Okay, this pricked my soul for a reason. And actually, let's go over there now. Let's go to Acts two, because we can often have a misconception of what this passage means as well. Um, Acts two. You can you you know when when there's something stirring in you when somebody says something or does something maybe they say it or do it from the pulpit maybe it's not even you maybe they hear something from like you hear over here a conversation and you're like mm-hmm. right and your soul gets pricked right like like if if that happens it is time for you to investigate not that person your heart why did that why did that drive an emotion why did that cause that does that make sense okay um so in um acts 2 and we're going to look at 36 it says therefore let all israel be assured of this god has made this jesus whom you crucified both lord and messiah when the people heard this they were cut to the heart and said to peter and and the other apostles brothers what shall we do pause there. This phrase cut to the heart is a beautiful phrase. Okay? But that phrase doesn't actually mean that they repented in their heart. Okay? So wait, where is that? Let me go back to my other notes here. Sorry, I got notes in a couple places. Okay? Um, oh, it's past Canaan's drawing. Hold on. Um, so what this phrase actually, it's quite incredible actually. Um, where is that? So this phrase cut to the heart, it actually means, mm, ah. so the word is katanuso. I love how Tam always is like, mmm, like, like she's like, yes, I've studied that. I remember this. <laughs> I know. It's um, close to me. K-A, so it's K-A-T-A-N-O-O-S. So K-A-T-A-N-O-O-S dash O. Oh, of course. Of course. <laughs> and it actually means to be agitated violently. Oh, okay. Ooh. I know. Now read that scripture. <laughs> they were cut. They were Whoa. agitated violently. To the, to the heart. To the heart. Oh. Their heart. Have you ever like has has like they were just told you guys murdered a man. That's on you. Not only did you murder a man, 
<coughs> who murdered him, and you weren't even there. <coughs> right? This is Pentecost. Right? There's hundreds of thousands. Um, uh, history tells us that there's hundreds of thousands of people here. And so Peter is preaching to the crowd, and he says, you guys murdered this guy. The guy that you, your whole, like, uh, nation has been waiting for, you killed him. You weren't even there, I know, but you killed him. Right? And, and they, it says that they were agitated violently. So when, when the word cuts us, and you know this, right? When the Holy Spirit cuts us, or even somebody else's words cut us, we can be agitated violently. Right? It's like, oof, oh, and ah, right? Ooh, that hurt. Right? But what we do from that moment forward defines whether or not we def- whether or not we are responding with godly sorrow or worldly sorrow right it defines whether or not we are looking and going wow god like so what did they do it says um they said to peter and the other apostles brothers what shall we do so this is what they said Okay. Now we don't know what the tone was. It could have been like some of them could have been like, oh, "What? What do we do?" Others could have been like, "What do we do? Like, what do you want? Like, okay, yeah, so, right? Like, we don't know. Like, we genuinely don't know. But what we do know is how many responded." It says Peter replied, "Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all far off for all whom the Lord our God will call." With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, "Save yourselves from this corrupt generation." So him telling them to repent wasn't enough. He had to, with many other words, warn them and convince them. <clears throat> right? Some of you guys are getting a whole new perspective on this passage. And it says, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So out of the hundreds of thousands of people who were cut to the heart, who were violently agitated at this accusation that they had sinned. You ever feel like that? Violently agitated that they may have sinned, right? Or, or maybe have done something probably not exactly the right way, right? Um, Only 3,000 responded to that violent agitation in their heart with, amen, Jesus is Lord, I I killed him, What what does he want from me? Just tell me what to do. Is this the way that you respond when somebody points out sin in your heart? I know we all respond with violent agitation, right? And, and I believe, like, like that's, that's, I believe, honestly, that's a gift from, from God to, to prick us in this way, right? He's like, hey, here it is, right? Um, or do we go to embarrassment? Or do we go to sadness? Or do we go to anger? Do we go to, and from that anger, maybe we never get to the sadness part. Maybe we get to resentment and bitterness. Because instead of taking that, that prick, and going, well, why can't, you know, why isn't there help? Why didn't she, you know? Wait, why am I feeling this way, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, so we have to get really good at identifying, like, when, when God pricks us, we need to get really good at dealing with our emotions and understanding first, Papa. like, am I in sin? Mm-hmm. Or are they in sin? Or maybe both of us are. Right? But but the scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.20 that we have to be reconciled to God. Like, that must be our ultimate goal at all times. Our ultimate goal must always go back to, God, am I honoring you? God, could this be? 
is this is this another brick on that wall that I that I like we already crushed? Like I don't I don't want that wall to get built back up. I I remember what that was like. I, I don't want that to happen. Right? And so so when you feel that prick or that hurt or whatever that is, whatever word you want to use there, first go be reconciled to God. First. Don't go and approach your brother or your sister first. Right? Go pray through it. Read scriptures. Get honest with yourself. Just, like, I can't tell you how many times I've told God, I'm like, God, just, you know, it's funny because I prayed that last week and then, or two weeks, three weeks ago, and then last week I had multiple conversations because I prayed, God, just, like, show me my sin. And then, like, I had four people come to me and say, hey, sis, hey, sis. Oh. And I was like, okay, and my God, like, I got you. Like, thank you for this. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so it's good to get in that practice of, like, God, just show me my sin and give me the humility to, like, just want to honor you versus um, giving into the embarrassment, right? Um, in the defiance, right? So, so one of the, the things that you can do is um, for for you to have that response to being pricked or getting hurt or whatever. You need to uh, be transformed in your mind, right? We have to go beyond the elementary teachings, and we have to go, okay, I need to be actually transformed in my mind. Romans 12, Romans 12, 2 tells us this. Um, if we pick it up in verse 1, it says, Therefore, 12, 1, Romans 12, 1, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. I love that. He starts off right there, right? Like, we can't get past anything if we don't have God's mercy at the forefront of our hearts and our lives. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We can't get past obstacles, trials, hurts, right? Unless we have that as our forefront. So it says, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. And he goes on to define what that looks like. He says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by what? By doing different things and creating different habits? No. Behaviors will stop, right? You have to build a conviction. By the renewing of your mind. That word re- repentance, it, it's metanoia. It's repent in heart. It's, it's, it's a change of heart and mind. Right? The, the word heart in the scriptures actually refer, it, it refers to um, the, the um, seat of thought and emotion. So it says we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Then we will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good, pleasing, and perfect will. God, what do you want from me? He's like, okay, well, what do you want from me? Like, <laughs> like, what do you really want? Well, I, I want this person to apologize. Well, they did apologize, Ariel. Okay, well, yeah, but so I, I didn't think they mean t- they didn't mean it. Okay, so what do you really want? Well, I want them to um, apologize publicly. Okay, so you want them to feel humiliated the same way you felt humiliated when they approached you in private. No. Yep, that's what I want. Right? Like, sometimes we just got to own it, guys. Like, sometimes we want vengeance, not justice. Oh. Right? Because true justice is, if we really wanted justice for God, we would want that person um, to walk closely with God more than, right, more than anything else. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. But he says when you transform your mind and you start to think like God, in view of God's mercy, how much mercy are we having on the other person? He says then you can test and approve what his will is. Meaning, like, should I approach this person? Should I not? Okay. I should. God, how do you want this conversation to go? Right? Um, I was in a, a discipling time with the Chavez's and um, you know and Fernando said something to me this is I don't know probably like 
two months ago. He said something to me, and I got mad. <clears throat> I got hurt. I got hurt, and then I got mad. Um, and um, and he was like, well, amen, sis, why don't you pray about it? And I was like, oh. <laughs> Um, That's and you know it's funny because in my in my own sin I was like no I'm just trying to understand no I just wanted him I wanted to, for him to say something that I could find a loophole to not have to obey that's what I wanted okay mm-hmm. and I didn't realize that until I went and reconciled myself with God wow. I was like oh so the very next tea time I said bro I prayed about it I'm sorry. Like, I realized that you said something in a way that made me feel like you were over it, over me, so tired of dealing with me. I gave in to those thought processes, um, and I allowed myself to think that of you, and I'm really sorry. I got super defensive, and I'm just so sorry, bro. And he was like, it's no... I mean, I forgive you. He's like, what did I say? And I told him what it was. And he's like, farthest thing from my mind. And I was like, I know, bro. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I feel like an idiot. But <clears throat> um, we have to learn this, guys. Like, the issue was not what he said or how he said it. The issue was God used that to bring up some insecurities that I had thought that I had dealt with but had actually just laid dormant for a while. Yeah. And it was so good, right? And so this is what it looks like to actually go get reconciled with God, right? I didn't say, bro, you need to apologize. I wasn't even looking for an apology. I was like, I was just like, I just need to apologize to you. I am sorry that like this was on me, right? <clears throat> you know, now because he's humble, he was just like, he want to know what I said. Or he want to know what he said and, he, and I shared it with him. And I was like, yeah, well, it's, bro it wasn't even you he's like no he's like I don't even remember saying that I'm so sorry if I did like that's not even you know Mm. um but his heart and my heart both in that moment in this discipling time right Eric and I were there Jackie and Fernando were there in this discipling time both of our hearts were like we just wanted like whatever's going to help each other be close to God whatever is going to be help you know us be right with God and that's got to be the heart right when you get hurt that has to be your heart we have to move beyond the elementary teaching of just go talk to your brother just go talk to your sister no mm-hmm. no i've seen people do that and it makes it worse because they haven't reconciled their hearts before the lord of like what's really going on does that make sense mm-hmm. right so you have to transform your mind and you can't do that if your mind is not first in view of God's mercy, right? So the, the reason that I was able to do that was because I had to go, okay, wait, God, what's this about? You love me, right? So then here's the way I do it, and this is where it comes into REPT, Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy. <clears throat> One of the ways you can do this is to first go, okay, Philippians 4, 8 tells us what? Whatever is true whatever is noble, right, blah, blah, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. For me, because I can be so sinful in my thought process, and I can make assumptions about people's hearts, I have to go, whatever is true. Okay, Ariel, I just stop right there. Like, those three words in that entire sentence, like, that's as far as I get every single time. Ariel, what's true? And I had to do this while I was praying. Because I was like, God, I feel like he, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, wait, no. Whatever is true. Okay, Father, like, what was true? And this isn't the only conversation I've had to do this with. There's been many conversations I've had to do this with. Some I've responded humbly, but I've had to go back and and really make sure my heart was right so that I didn't get resentful and spin out other things. But I have to go, well, what is true? Well, he thought this of me. No. Mm -hmm. What was true? Okay, he said these exact words. That's what was true. I cannot slap any truth on his intentions or motives. Because I don't know. That's for the Lord to know. Right? What does the Bible tell us in Jeremiah 17, 9, and 10? 
right? It says, the heart is deceitful above all things. Mm -hmm. Who can understand it? God's people know. It says, I, the Lord, can understand it, right? And then he goes on to say that I will um, examine the mind, right? Examine the heart and the mind to see, right? To reward each person according to their conduct, right? Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10. So I can't slap any truth on what they felt, their intentions, or their motives. Mm-hmm. But how many times do we do that, guys? Mm-hmm. Well, because last time. Oh. 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 Well, if you have a last yeah. time, then you didn't get reconciled to, with God the last time. Oh, so that's on you. Oh. Right? Yeah. There should be no last time because what does 2 Corinthians 13 tell us? Or 1 Corinthians 13 tells us, it tells us love keeps what? No record of wrongs. Okay, Sam, I'm just say. Right? So then Romans 12, 9 tells us love must be sincere. Yeah. Right? And if love is sincere, then it keeps no record of wrong. Then it, it trusts the motives. It trusts the, right? It just tr- it trusts that God is sovereign, and you're going to go, I, I'm going to trust. Right? It is so hard to do. So hard to do. But this is what it means when the um, when the greatest commandment tells us to love the Lord your God with all of our heart. We're like, yay, heart, soul, okay, strength, all right, yeah, I'll just keep going, keep fighting. Mind, I didn't even know that was in there. Oh, no. <laughs> but what gets us into trouble? It's our thoughts. Wow. Our thoughts get us into trouble. We don't all of a sudden fall into sexual immorality. Yeah. We don't all of a sudden masturbate. No. We we've had thoughts well before that. Right? Okay. So we have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Right? Um, because so so the first part of Repti is okay, what is true? Just start there. What's actual truth? What actually happened? He said this. Period. That's it. That's all. That's all. That's it. And then what was true? I felt this. I thought this. I made this assumption. I got mad. I stopped listening. Then he said this. I took something out of context because I was mad, embarrassed, stopped listening, angry, making assumptions. Right? Anybody relate? No? Just me? Yeah. <laughs> raise your hand. Okay. Um, there's that old deodorant commercial. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you're sure. Anybody? No? Okay. Uh, back in the back in the early nineties. Oh, wow. sis. Oh wait, y'all weren't born. <laughs> you lost me. Y'all weren't born. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, so I love you. Sorry, I have to leave early. No, you don't have to apologize. You're totally fine. This is totally Love you. 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 Was this person in sin or was I? Did she fail? Booty? Oh, the screen, the screen door. Oh, the screen oh. door. Yeah, the screen door. Um, okay, now you want me. Now, can you go check? Because now I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It sounds. No. Okay. 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 Thanks. She's like, there's nobody laying on them. <clears throat> so did you say, did I say? Yeah. <laughs> so now you have to. So, so that's when you can help. And. But, but before you try to figure out whether or not they were in sin, first figure out your own heart. Figure out your own heart, because then you'll be able to see their, if they, if they did sin against you, you'll be able to see, um, you'll be able to test and approve and to see what God's will is, right? You'll be able to see with God's mercy in view, because you're, you've already realized, like, wow, this, wow, God, this was my sin. Right? This is, wow. God, you just exposed in me an insecurity. And what was really cool, you guys, is... You know, um, it was an insecurity that, um, like I said, had laid dormant for a while, but I realized that God had tried to bring it up in other situations. And I just kind of, you know, the Holy Spirit says, look at this, and you're like, no, I'm good. 
It's like that check engine light that comes on. Yeah. What check engine light? Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, right? And I'm bad with this. Like, anybody who gets in it, Malik has been driving our BMW. And I'm like, bro, just so you know, like, our dashboard is lit up like a Christmas tree. Oh, wow. Right? Oh, like, oh, 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 like there's a, there's a fix this, fix that, fix this, fix that. And I'm like, please, but please, the brakes please. work. And uh, it's an oil change. <laughs> and the last time we took it in, they said we could go six more months with those things, right? And so he's oh. like, <laughs> I'm like, but at your risk. He's like, amen. Dang. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it's faith or lack of money or whatever. That's the accumulation. But <laughs> that's actually why we drive the we drive the um, Hyundai mostly because it's going to cost us like three grand to get the other one fixed, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but anyways, um, but I think that's similar, right? Like you guys, like we have to. The Holy Spirit will tell us, "Hey, check your engine." Look under the hood. Mm. But because we don't want to go there because we're not really sure what we're going to find, <coughs> right? We're like, no, I'm good. That's a day. Like, we don't want to open a dark closet because we're like, I don't know what's in there and there's no light. Uh. But, but at some point, you have to shine light on your dark closet. Wow. Right? Like, because you've got to see what's in there. Because you might need something from that closet. But it's inaccessible. Like, some of us want to date and get married. Okay? But you're not willing to shine that light on that dark closet. And that dark closet, you're like, oh, no, no, what's in there is a bunch of hurt that people haven't apologized to before yet. And God's like, actually, no, what's in there is what's keeping you from actually dating. <laughs> what's in there is your inability to forgive quickly. What's in there is a lack of grace. What's in there is deep insecurity. What's in there, right? Like, this is what's in there, right? For me, the closet that I have had to go recently to is, is ownership and submission. Like, real, genuine submission to my husband. Not obedience submission. Like, submission of the heart, which is a total different ballgame. And it's been so good. It's damaged our family. It's damaged how the kids, like, see dad. It's damaged a lot. But I've had to, like, okay, what's in that closet? Right? Um, and I've had to take ownership of that. Right? Um, so how long do you want to wait? Right? Because I, I believe, I genuinely believe that when we get pricked by, by pain or sin or whatever, um, that it's totally from God. Mm. Everything can be used for God's glory. Mm. Every single thing. Right? Everything can be used for God's glory. Right? And if you're like me and how I can be sometimes, like, um, <clears throat> here's what's fun. Check this out. Job 36. Okay? If you're like me and you're not totally convinced yet, uh, <clears throat> Job is a really great book. To help your heart. Now, really, the only part of Job that's actually good advice is anything that's offered up by Elihu. Mm. Um, because um, God rebukes um, Job's friends at the end, saying that they were not speaking on behalf of him, and they were actually not speaking what was accurate to his character. The only one he doesn't put in that list that he rebukes is Elihu. So, Job 36, in verse... Eight. Well, let's start in verse 5. Verse 5 says, God is mighty but despises no one. How cool is that? Yeah. Like, God is powerful but he doesn't hate anybody. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Yeah. Like, just, like, let's resonate on that for a minute. Like, when you get corrected or when somebody brings something to you and it feels hurtful and you're like, God hates me, and you go to that shame place, I was like, where'd you get that from? Totally not for me. Right? Okay? He says he despises no one. But it also says right after that, he is mighty and firm in his purpose. Mm -hmm. He doesn't hate you, but his thumb is going to be on you until you open that dark closet and bring it into the light. Right? So if you're not convinced, like some of us are 
I'm like, nope, nope, nope. That was that person's issue. No, 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 no. That was totally like they were in sin. I got confirmation from other people that they were in sin. No, 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 no. no. no, 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 no. They over here. They no, 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 no. See, like, yeah, I sinned in this way, but like that whole situation, it was a whole mess. The whole thing. It was a whole like it was a whole thing, right? Oh no, sis. When you really get reconciled with God, your story changes. Your story changes. <laughs> Think about this. Because God's going to keep that firm purpose. Like, you're like, why do I keep on ending up in this place? Oh, wait, that's, no, I can't. I'm not looking in the closet. I don't keep on ending up in this place. Mm-hmm. I just can't trust God's leaders. Oh, no. That's oh, what it is. No. <laughs> right? right? I just can't trust the brothers. <laughs> that's oh, what it is. Oh, not the right? <laughs> I just can't have roommates. Oh, 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 oh it's like, roommates. It's just... <laughs> That, that that's what it is. Like, what is the common denominator, guys? It's you. It's you. It's me. Right? Um, right? And so so he's like, I'm firm and mighty my purpose, right? And then he goes and then he goes on, he says he's uh, he says he does not keep the wicked alive but gives the afflicted their rights. He does not take their eyes he does not take his eyes off the righteous, he enthrones them to the kings and is all for forever. But if people are bound in chains and held fast by cords of affliction, if you've been struggling with the same thing over and over again and you find yourself getting into the same place, the bitterness, the sin, the hurt, like all that kind of stuff, similar situations but not exactly, he's like, look, you're bound in chains. You're held fast by cords of your own affliction. Right? And then he says, he tells them what they have done. They've been hurt by people, and they just need to go tell them they're in sin. That's not what it says. It says they have sinned arrogantly. Like, God's like, fix your closet, guys. Come on. Right? So, before we do anything, right? And so, and then he says, he makes them listen to correction. (laughs) He makes them. I have been made to listen to correction in my lifetime over and again, right? He could, sometimes it's taken like a couple years in one area. Sometimes it's taken a couple of hours. Right? This is he makes them listen to correction and he commands them to repent of their evil. If they obey and serve him, they will spend the rest of their days in prosperity and their years in contentment. But if they do not listen, they will perish by the sword and die without knowledge. And we don't want to be that position. Right? And so... <coughs> So we have to get really good at going, I'm going to transform my mind, right? I think about the woman um, who, um, let's close out here, Luke 7. <clears throat> Luke 7, this, this incredible woman shows us how we need to, like when we, when we get hurt by somebody, how we first need to reconcile our hearts to God. <coughs> before we then go approach the person, right? Um, maybe what you'll find is there's nothing there, but you'll at least find out how to address that person and the sin, because you might think it's one sin, but really after prayer and reconciliation with God in your own heart, you realize, oh wait, it's not this sin, it's that sin. That was the sin, okay, right? Or maybe it wasn't even sin, maybe it was, hey, you know what, could you consider a different... Um, way to talk about X, Y, Z, right? I had a sister recently approach me and she said, hey, there's some comments that you've made and um, I just don't know where you're coming from on this and I just wanted to understand. That was an incredible way. She had been praying about it. She came and approached me and she said, "There's an, and she said, I just want to understand. And I shared what I shared, my uh, thought process. I, I shared my backstory in this certain area of my life. And she was like, that makes a lot of sense. But you know what was really cool is it helped me to see that I had taken on a persona that was passed on to me, and I didn't even realize it. I didn't even realize it. It was so good and so rich. I was so grateful. And so that it wasn't a correction on sin. It was a, let me understand, right? Mm-hmm. And then, but what I realized, I was like, wow, sis, like, I don't want to be a stumbling block, so I can take these different words out of my vocabulary. No problem. Done, done, done. Right? Mm-hmm. And it's okay. It's no big deal. Right? Like, I'm not attached to it. But it was really cool. Um, 
because sometimes we think like they should know but you know what sometimes we don't yeah right like sometimes we don't i was having a conversation with val just the other day she had no idea that i was raised below the poverty line she thought i was just this like white suburban girl most some of you guys may have think that too but but i was raised below the poverty line at five years old, I was milking calves, not because it was fun and it was a cute little, you know, science project, but because we had to raise that calf to send it to slaughter to put meat on our table. Like, like that's how I was raised. I wasn't raised with a silver spoon in my mouth. She had no idea. Fair, right? She And I was telling her stories about my family and my upbringing, and she's like, Ariel, you are blowing my mind right now. I had no idea. Like, I thought that you were raised in white suburban, standard, typical, like, Clovis Unified School District where everybody has everything and seems to have no want for no need, no anything. I'm like, no, my perspective doesn't come from that place. My perspective comes from a very different place. Um, and so sometimes, you guys, we might think people know, but we don't. We just don't. Um, or you're a certain age, so you should know. Well, you may not. <laughs> it's okay. It's totally fine, right? Um, but when we approach God this way, um, Luke 7, verse 36 says, When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. <clears throat> Chapter 7, verse 36. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair and kissed them and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him a 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one you, who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the wo woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus told her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this that even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. We read another account of a, uh, a beggar being healed. And it says that your faith has healed him. Jesus tells him your faith has healed him. But this woman, <clears throat> it struck me today that like, she was so aware of her sin, and she went in like totally in view of Jesus' mercy, 100% in view of his mercy. She, she didn't know that he was going to forgive her. Like, that was not a guarantee. Does that make sense? Yes. Like, he could have not forgiven her. But in her heart, she had great faith in who he was. And so in her heart, she was like, I know I'm going to be forgiven. Because otherwise, he wouldn't say, your faith, right? Like, her faith in who he was and what he was about. Like, it was so amazing. But <clears throat> we have to have this heart. Right? When we get pricked by the Holy Spirit that, that causes pain, that causes violent agitation, we have to have this heart of, <clears throat> okay, God, like, I, I know all the sins I've, I've committed in my past. My past as much as even yesterday or even an hour ago. But you're stirring something in me now. What is it? Right? Like, she understood. And when he says that, he says that um, her great love has shown, whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Right? Mm -hmm. 
It's not because any one of us have been forgiven more or less. All of us have been forgiven equally. Equally. Right? But our view of our sin is what makes it more or less. Right? Like, Evelyn may have murdered somebody and I may have lied about taking out the trash. But if my view of lying about taking out the trash is, wow, like, that put God I'm sorry, like, let me see. Is this pricking? Is this violent agitation? God, what else is there in there? What else is there? Like, what am I not seeing? Right? Then then that's what he's talking about. Like, at that point, I have been loved more than ever because I see my need. I see how much God has loved me. Mm. So my, my love then from that pours out. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Mm. That's what that scripture is talking about. Because it's not talking about, wow, like, yeah, like, you were a mess. No, we have to have deep conviction that all sin is the same. So when we get hurt, we get pricked, we get violently agitated, we have to go, wait, all sin is the same. Jesus died for this. Whatever this is, he died for. And I need to figure out what this is so that I don't continue to live in it. Right? Yeah. And so that I can clearly see whatever correction is coming my way. And so that I can clearly see if this person was in sin. Man, I want to go back to Matthew 18 and go, I hope that I can win them over to God's heart for them. Mm. So that they don't continue to struggle this, in this area. Not... I hope that they see that they were wrong, that they hurt me, and then now they're going to do whatever I need them to do to make it right. That's not godly. That's selfish. That's not what it's about. It's about being in this room, coming together, as Ezra 3 1 says, coming together as one and going, I want to build each other up, you know what I mean? So that we can get to heaven, right? And really look out for each other's souls in that way, right? But don't let Satan make it about this. It's never about this. Never, never, never. It's always about this. And Satan is just trying to drive a wedge, right? So so the practical is with Rev T, right? You write it down. You go, what is true? Right? First thing is, what is true? What things are right? The second thing is, in view of God's mercy, mm-hmm. right? Romans 12, 1. In view of God's mercy, like, and then Romans 12, 2. How do I need to see this? And then you write down um, a third thing. And the third thing is, how have I reacted in the same way? Right? You want to look at similar reactions and go, wow, did I make assumptions there? What was true in this situation? And I will guarantee you, and this works every time at ER, I will guarantee you that what you're going to find is you're going to find how you respond to hurt. Whether the hurt is coming from God through correction, because we know that it cuts like a scalpel, right? The word cuts. Um, Or whether the hurt is coming because somebody sinned against you, you're going to see your sin cycle. Right? And then you got to go and you got to walk that straight out into the light and go, how have I responded? And wow, and you're going to, it's going to blow your mind, right? This is basically the eight weeks of ER that you're getting, right? And you just journal through it and you go, wow, like this is, this is my sin cycle. God, I don't want to be like this. I want my, I want my reaction time to be like, wow, God, what do you, did you just say that you saw something in me? Okay, show me. That's, that needs to become our reaction type, right? Um, when it comes to um, being hurt, um, being pricked, being violently agitated, right? Even being sinned against. What did you show me? Oh, when they sinned against me, I didn't have immediate compassion on them because they just like broke, tr- broke their relationship with you in that space. I didn't have immediate compassion. Instead, oh, I had immediate vengeance and justice. I thought about me versus thinking about like, wow, they must be hurting 
right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's going to reveal a lot in you guys, but this is like, I'm, I'm grateful for this lesson because I needed it, because I need to make sure I'm constantly going back to this space, but prayerfully, um, you guys walk away with at least a practical of how to address your heart, how to address sin, how to address hurt, and how to decide whether or not you're either being sinned against or whether you're just hurt. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Okay. <laughs>